Classics has been taught at the University of Otago since its establishment in 1869, with the Chair of Classics being one of the foundation chairs. Latin was also compulsory at that time too. Our students have long engaged with the classical world, studying the ancient languages, immersing themselves in Greek and Latin literature, examining key turning points in the history of the ancient Mediterranean, and exploring the Otago Museum's rich collection of coins, sculpture, and artifacts. In the 21st century, the study of classics remains both vibrant and vital for a fully rounded appreciation of the roots of civilization. John Hall is a professor in the classics department here at Otago. He grew up in London and having received his academic training in the United Kingdom and in America, moved to New Zealand some 20 years ago. He's an internationally renowned scholar and specialising in Roman works. During his time at Otago, he's lectured widely in classics, teaching courses ranging from ancient Greek po uh, poetry to Latin literature and society. And it's with pleasure I invite Professor John Hall to give the graduation address today. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto kato. Let me begin by congratulating all of the graduates today. We're here this afternoon to celebrate your achievements and hope you feel a sense of accomplishment as you look back over the last few years. I hope too that your friends and family here today are watching on with moist-eyed pride. Now I believe it's traditional for a speaker at graduation to try to offer some advice to students based on his or her many years of worldly wisdom how to face the challenges of real life, how to make your way in the world. Well, I'm afraid there are a couple of problems. First, I'm pretty sure it's a sound general principle in life not to take advice from someone wearing a silly hat <laughs> and dress head to toe in burnt orange. <laughs> but that aside, although I'm pretty old, I'm not sure I have, I'm wise enough to offer you any profound insights. So instead, my advice has a much more modest aim to help you get through the Christmas barbecue with your family. <laughs> Let me explain. I'm not sure about you, but my family Christmases as a university student could be rather stressful, especially at parties, where there would always be some uncle or auntie asking me, Greek and Latin, what are you studying that for? To be fair, it's an honest question. The problem is that it was typically uttered in a tone of hostile disbelief and often rounded off with a flourish what are you going to do with that? Teach? As if teaching were one rung below crack dealer on the ladder of <laughs> desirable occupations. I have to admit, I don't think I handled these interrogations very well. I tended to get a bit defensive and almost agree with them. Yeah, well, I suppose. I didn't really have the confidence, experience and poise to present a decent response to such challenges and so I'd spend the rest of the day feeling grumpy and inconsequential. With the wisdom of hindsight, what I wished I'd said is, I'm studying that because I like it and it's important, auntie. <laughs> and that really is the sum of my advice. Now you could also try the economic argument, I suppose. Research in the US and UK shows that graduates in the humanities do in fact generally end up in higher paid jobs than peers in other disciplines. Actually, a few worried parents out there, I should probably repeat that. <laughs> Graduates in the humanities do in fact generally end up in higher paid jobs. It's going to be okay. <laughs> but I think it's important to take the first argument very seriously. These subjects are worth studying for their own sake, because I like them and they're important. <laughs> now, decent academics are supposed to provide evidence to back up their crazy theories, so let me offer you some thoughts on my own area of expertise. I'm sure my colleagues behind me from other departments could tell, the same, could tell you the same about their own disciplines, but I can speak best about my own experiences. Three years ago, I introduced into our curriculum a first year course with the title, Roman Social History, Slaves, Gladiators, Prostitutes. In what way is any of this important? Well, let's take the three topics individually. First, slaves. The Romans were good at slavery, very good. Some modern scholars estimate that one person in every six walking the streets of Rome was a slave. Yes, over the years, there were some slave rebellions, 
The revolt led by Spartacus is the best known, perhaps. But Spartacus lost. For over 600 years, the Romans were able to successfully subjugate and exploit hundreds and hundreds of thousands of fellow human beings for much of the time without any obvious moral anxiety. This fact raises some troubling ethical questions. In many respects, the Roman writer that I study, Cicero, was a pretty nice guy. He loved his family, showed kindness to his friends, and he wrote complex philosophical treatises on our moral obligations to each other. And yet this decent and apparently enlightened bloke shows no worries about buying slaves and working them hard in the fields of his estates. Why not? Well, this is a fascinating question that intersects with various humanities disciplines, such as political studies, social psychology, and philosophy. How is power allotted and distributed in society? What allows humans to treat each other in such ways? And more urgently, perhaps, if we had that time travel machine and could put ourselves in ancient Rome, how would we behave? I think that's a pretty darn important question, auntie. Similar considerations apply when we turn to consider Roman prostitutes. In fact, I spend quite a few lectures, lectures examining the challenges faced in Roman society by women as a whole. The picture that emerges is not a particularly happy one, but this is precisely what makes it worth studying. In my experience, students find the basic facts quite eye-opening. The intense social pressure for a Roman girl to marry at the age of 15 or so. The intense social pressure to produce children immediately the 30% chance of your child dying in its first year of life because of the lack of decent medical care, a fair chance of the mother herself dying young in childbirth for the same reasons, and no vote in any of the elections. As you can imagine, getting a decent Wi-Fi signal was a nightmare as well. And not surprisingly, the experience of female prostitutes was even worse. Most were slaves and so exploited economically by their pimps, and then of course exploited sexually by their customers. Within this dark realm of existence, we find only the occasional lighter shade of gray. An inscription, for example, from a tavern, apparently owned by four women, whose colorful names suggest a background in the prostitution business. The most optimistic view is that these women had somehow managed to buy their way out of slavery and set up their own independent business, running things for themselves without too much interference from men. But then, taverns in Rome often doubled as brothels. So it's possible that they were still in the trade and to this extent still being exploited. The best they could hope for perhaps was being exploited on their own terms. Finally, what about gladiators? Well, let me start with a teaching prop. that's now 20 years old. It derives from a petrol company promotion in connection with the 1995 Rugby World Cup a plastic figurine of one of the leading All Blacks players, one of Otago's greatest products, perhaps the second best international number seven after Richie McCaw, distinctive head guard, initials JK, but not J John Kerwin. Josh Crom, yeah. Oh, Josh Cromfell, thank you. What has this to do with gladiators? We would like to think today that we're pretty sophisticated in our modes of mass marketing and consumerism product placement, merchandise tie-ins. So it may come as a bit of a surprise to learn that Roman entrepreneurs were doing this kind of thing 2,000 years ago. Archaeologists have found many such figurines of gladiators in their excavations. Pottery and metal, of course, not plastic, but the implications are the same. These gladiatorial contests had a high public profile and generated intense interest. At this point, some of my students will say, oh, I get it. Gladiatorial shows were just like today's wrestling and boxing, boxing matches. To which my reply is, well, yes and no. Yeah, nah. <laughs> Large-scale business enterprises, yes. A high degree of showmanship for promotional purposes, yes. A combination of skill with raw violence, yes. But there's a crucial difference. People got killed regularly. Just how regularly is a matter of heated academic debate. We know, for example, that bouts could sometimes end in honorable draws. But still, if you went to the games for a couple of days and saw perhaps six bouts on each afternoon, it's pretty likely that you'd see at least one individual badly injured or killed. Go for 20 years, 
This is all a very big difference. There's no, nothing in it, nothing like it in modern sport. There's a crucial moral line that's being crossed here. All of which raises the question, where were the protesters? Where were the tie-dyed hippies with their placard chanting, free the gladiators? In short, nowhere. Why not? Again, that's an interesting and complex question. And again, a lot has to do with the fact that many gladiators were slaves. But there is another element in the equation, I think. It was the wealthy upper classes who sponsored these events. Rich businessmen put up the huge amounts of cash needed to train the gladiators and build amphitheaters. As we know in Dunedin, stadiums don't just build themselves. And then rich politicians spent huge amounts hiring them out and sponsoring individual shows. Why bother? Because big shows translated into big votes in political elections. This disturbing exploitative cycle raises a further controversial issue. What is the role of our leaders in guiding our morality? The Roman people were in fact conditioned to admire and look up to men such as Julius Caesar and the Emperor Augustus. So if these guys were happy to pay for gladiators, there couldn't be anything wrong with it, could there? But it seems to me that the result of recent elections overseas has made this kind of question more pressing than ever. This humanity stuff, I like it and it's important, auntie. I hope you manage to enjoy your Christmas barbecue. Thank you.